the people who supported Jordan in his life and in his death. Jordan had a family. Jordan was loved. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a mental illness, sometimes you decide to pull away. And people look at that and say, well, where's his family? Where's his support? But I want you to know that his family supported him. He always had a place to live. He always had a place to be, no matter what the situation was. But he had demons. He went through tragedy at a very young age. This is who Jordan was. And then tragedy struck. You can look at this photo and see any of us in this picture. There's people in middle school and elementary school who remember Jordan this way. And then his mother was taken from him. And her body was dumped in a suitcase on the highway. And it changed Jordan's mentality forever. And he tried to deal with it as best as possible. To deal with it, he made other people smile. He sang, he danced, he entertained. Even though, even though he couldn't smile, he made other people smile. That's who Jordan was. That's what everyone needs to know before we talk about charges, before we talk about the person who took his life, we need to know who he was and who he had with him. That's who Jordan Neely was. So we want to thank everybody that Jordan represented. He was one of us. But there are a lot of people dealing with mental illness. And they could be in the same situation. There are a lot of families who care for those people, but they can't find them right now. They may be walking the subways. They may be houseless on the streets. And those families are wondering what will happen to my loved one because I can't reach them. That's why it's important to have services available. That's why it's important for the mayor to be talking about what we can do to address mental health in our communities. We wanna thank the, the people who represent uh, the homeless and the houseless communities because we all could be one paycheck or two away from that happening to us. We could be one tragedy away from that happening to us. So who are we to look at someone and say they were houseless, so they must be a bad person. They were houseless, so they must have been about to attack us. They must have been about to hurt us. So we had the right to take his life because our life matters more. That's not the situation we want to live in. That's not the community we want to have. We don't want it where you can kill someone because you thought there was a possibility they could do something to you. There was no attack. Mr. Neely did not attack anyone, he did not touch anyone, he did not hit anyone, but he was choked to death. And that can't stand. That can't be what we represent. His father here, Andre, lost a son. His Aunt Mildred lost someone she cared for very, very much. She tells us stories about how he would come to her house on the good days and ask her to take a shower, ask her for food, and she would provide that for him. But when he had bad days, he didn't want to be around people that he know loved them because he didn't want to disappoint them because he was at a low point. He didn't want to be judged and lose maybe the love that he had even though they would have never lost that love. This is really what we're dealing with. We have to care about people. We're all human beings that's trying the best we can in this life. And we need each other. No one on that train asked Jordan, what's wrong? How can I help you? He was choked to death instead. So for everybody saying, I've been on the train and I've been afraid before, and I can't tell you what I would have done in that situation, I'm going to tell you. Ask how you can help. Please, don't attack, don't choke, don't kill, don't take someone's life, don't take someone's loved one from them because they're in a bad place. No one on that train said, you started out by saying, I'm hungry, I need food, 
I'm done with it. I don't know where to get food. I don't care if I die. I don't care if I go to jail. I'm just done. No one said, here you are, sir. Let me meet your need or help you in a situation or give a word of encouragement. That's not what happened on that train. So should Daniel Penny be charged with manslaughter? Absolutely. Because he acted with indifference. He didn't care about Jordan. He cared about himself. And we can't let that stand. That's not who we are. That's not who we want to be. So we thank you for coming out. We thank everyone that's raised a sign, that's raised their voice, that made a post and said, mental illness has to be addressed. Houselessness has to be addressed. We have to take care of each other. I'm asking everyone to continue to do that so that we don't have situations where people are taken from us, but at the same time, we have safe scenarios in our city, in our communities. We don't want anybody afraid on the subway. But we want people to look at those that may be there in that situation and say, why? And how can I help them or make a difference? That's what we're asking for. So I'm going to bring up my partner, Lyndon Edwards, and he'll discuss with you uh, some of the charges and the involved situation but our first concern is Jordan Neely and his family. Hello, everyone. We want to thank you again for coming out. Um, I want to introduce Aunt Mildred, Jordan's aunt, and obviously Andre Zachary, who is Jordan's father. They didn't lose a son or a nephew. Jordan was taken from them. When we learned that Daniel Penny was merely questioned and released, we knew that justice would not be swift. We realized that justice was going to be a journey. And so today we want to not stop, because we're not going to stop until we get full justice. We're going to pause. We're pausing to recognize that we've taken the first step, a step in the right direction. We're closer now to justice than we were a week ago because Daniel Penny has been arrested and he should be arraigned even as we're speaking right now. Now, I had a conversation on Tuesday. Uh, Mr. Zachary and I had a conversation with the district attorney. And at that time, they called to offer their condolences. We said, thank you for your condolences, but we want an arrest. When is the arrest going to happen? They told us they had no timeline for an arrest. They were still gathering evidence. They were still working on it. And we told them that there is enough evidence already for an arrest. There is enough information already for the process of justice to begin. Time is ticking. And this is not right. Mr. Zachary got on the phone and he told the DA, he said, this is not right. And so they told us that Maybe, maybe in June there would be an arraignment. Maybe. And we said, no, it's got to happen now. Our city needs it to happen now. The family needs it to happen now. And so we were overjoyed to learn that yesterday we were informed that the arrest would happen today. And I say, keep going. Keep going. Now, I, I want to address something that we heard that Daniel Penny is saying. He is saying that he saw Jordan ball up his fist. And I just want to mention to you this. On May 1st, I'm sure the police questioned him. I'm sure that everybody read the statement that he and his attorneys put out. Was that anywhere in the statement? Was it anywhere? It was not. And I'm telling you this. Watch Jordan Neely's story get worse, according to Daniel Penny, and watch Daniel Penny's story get better. He's going to, Daniel Penny is getting a chance to rewrite what happened in the subway that, that, that day as time goes by. He's going to come up with more and more things to make himself look better because that's the only way that he can escape the consequences of what he did. But I tell you one thing, he cannot rewrite how the story ends. The story ends with his arms wrapped around Jordan's neck, choking him to death. And that's what he has to pay for. Those are the consequences that we cannot allow in our society. 
We cannot allow that type of, of aggression with, on a whim's notice. We cannot allow that type of judgment, and we cannot allow that type of crime to happen without consequences. So on behalf of the family, we're asking for everyone to continue to support the process of justice moving forward because that's the only thing that's going to change the way that we look at people who are houseless, the way we look at people who are in distress, and the way that we look at one another. Jordan loved Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson wrote a song that says, uh, I'm looking at the man in the mirror, and, and I'm asking him to change his ways. And I'm saying that, that that song talks about looking at ourselves, at our city, and looking at that reflection and asking ourselves, do we like what we see? Do we like how we treat one another? Do we like how we judge one another? And the bottom line is, this story says we can't answer yes to that. We cannot answer yes. We have to look at the changes that need to be made from the top down. So we want to thank AOC. We want to thank everyone, every politician who has spoken out about these issues. And we're asking for changes to be made so that there is not another Jordan Neely story like this. We're asking for changes to happen so that the adequate funding is there so that people get the help that they need. We're in a city where we're where the financial capital of the world. We have to be able to make a difference. Now, when I talked to the DA, I suggested murder too. They suggested manslaughter too. And now we're hearing that that's going to be the charge. The consequences of manslaughter too is five to 15 years. Ask yourself, is that enough? Is that enough for someone who choked somebody out on the train and took their life? Five to 15 years. Murder too, up to 25 to life. So we need a full cup of justice here and we're asking for us to continue to press forward until that happens. Now, I do want you to just take a look at these folks here. They represent the family. There are two here, but they represent the whole family. And I'm asking you to have a heart, have a heart and continue to press forward until justice is served for this family. It's about this family because this family is part of our community. I want to thank you for your time and for your attention, everyone. So now we will have questions. I will, you can just raise your hand or something like that, and I can just point to you right here. My name is Lennon Edwards. This is Mildred. I'll allow you to say your name for the Mildred folks so they hear your voice. Andre Zachary. Z-A-C-H-E-R-Y for Zachary. Uh, Andre, A-N-D-R-E. And Mildred, M I L D R E D. And the correct spelling of your last name is M A H A Z U. M A H A Z U. All right? Yes, I'm sorry. Just, justice looks like a conviction, and justice looks like uh, a conviction for murder. When, when you are someone who is trained, we, we, we've heard about how um, Daniel Penny was trained. He was a decorated, they say, Marine. If you're decorated, to me, that means that you've gone through more training and more situations than someone who's a, a, new, a newbie in, in the process of, of, of military. Now, when you're trained in combat, that gives you something that the average person does not have. It gives you options. It gives you the option of bear hugging, of striking, of many other things. But Daniel Penny chose, intentionally chose, a technique to use that is designed to cut off air. That's what he chose. And he chose to continue to hold that chokehold minute after minute, second after second, until there was no life left in Jordan Neely. That's a choice that he made, and he did it intentionally. So we believe that the, that the conviction should be for murder because that's intentional. Here, here's, here's the thing. What did he think would happen? What did he think would happen when he choked him and held on for almost 15 minutes? So if you look at this and say, was it intentional? Did Daniel Penny get up that morning saying, I'm going to go murder somebody? I don't believe he did. But in that moment, even if he was afraid to begin with, at some point, when people are screaming, let him go, you're going to kill him. At some point when people are saying, 
He defecated on himself, which is a sign he's losing his life. At some point when somebody screams, my wife is a nurse, I'm telling you, you're going to kill him. You're going to get a murder charge. He could have chose to let him go, but he didn't. And what did he think would happen if he didn't? He had to know he would die. He had to. Next question. So the changes that we're talking about, uh, what changes can we have for mental health in the city? I think Mayor Eric Adams uh, took a good step this week. He started out on the wrong side. He started out by saying, we don't have enough information, but I do know of situations where people assisted someone on the subway. He knew that that's not the case here. So we applaud him for having an about face and for really making this about what the issues need to be which is mental health. How do we make that change? Yes, we provide services. And at some point, we have to recognize that if you're dealing with mental health, you don't know how to help yourself in certain situations. Specifically here, Jordan had family. He had a house to go to. There were many doors open to him, but he didn't know how to process his grief. He didn't know how to process his mental health. There were times where he was in a facility and the family asked him, can you keep him? He's not ready to come home yet. But they didn't. They sent him along his way because he, were, he was not in a current crisis. And they said, we need the bed. So we're gonna get him out of here. Even though the family asked that they kept him, that, uh, even though the family asked that they keep them there and render treatment until he was actually better. So that's a positive step that we can take. Does it mean that sometimes you have to bring people in even if they don't want to in the moment. Yes. Does it mean sometimes you may have to keep people, even if they want to go home or go out? Yes, but we have to take an affirmative step in helping people. The time to just relax and let people that need help come to us is over. Go ahead, in the book. Uh, what do you think this case tells us about New York in this moment, fear, a lot of debate about the subway, a lot of debate about safety? It tells us that New York is aware of what's going on. Uh, and conversation needs to be had by the people who are in positions to make changes. We have a voice, but the ones who have the power and the authority to make changes have to have the courage to do it. And they have to have the courage to speak up. And we find that only a fraction of those in power are willing to say what needs to be said. And that tells us that an even smaller amount are, have the courage to do what needs to be done. We have to judge our leaders by their actions, not by their words. We're told a lot, but we need to see more done. Let me, let I me just. That, I, I think that New York has responded, and I think that our country is actually responding. The issue of fear is not isolated to the subways, and it's not isolated to New York. It's something that all of us need to address. But we need to be mindful of why we feel fear, and who we're projecting our fear on, and what, what steps we take to remedy ourselves of fear. And it can't be that we kill our fellow civilians to remedy our, our fear, because fear is subjective. Fear is subjective. ABC, ABC, ABC. 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 Yeah. Go ahead, right here, hey, right here. I'm, I'm asking a question here. So, sir, um, we saw the last three and a half minutes of Jordan's life. Have you talked to witnesses that will allow you to reconstruct the last few minutes before those uh, those videotape minutes, I mean, can you please describe what they said? Yes, we can. We, we have spoken to witnesses who were there on that train, who was engaged, and who told us that the time frame was up to 15 minutes. That's substantial. It shows a lot, both for Daniel Penny, who they say came up from behind Jordan Neely. Jordan Neely entered that train he hit the, train, hit the train wall when he came in. He stood in the middle of the train car, said he was hungry. He needed food. He wasn't going to take no for an answer. I don't care if I die. I don't care if I go to jail. I'm just done. I'm tired. I'm hungry. He took his jacket off and threw it to the ground. 
That jacket symbolized the only protection that he had from anything. He took it off saying, I'm, 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 I don't have anything. I'm open. And nobody helped him in that moment. He had on a t-shirt that showed clearly he did not have a weapon. But he said, this is all I have. And when he did that, in that moment, Daniel Penny came from behind him and choked him to death and held on for 15 minutes. So that shows, one, Daniel Penny knew that Jordan Neely would die after that amount of time. We also have to address how is someone allowed to be on the subway in New York City and be assaulted for 15 minutes straight and never receive any help, never receive any assistance? The MTA needs to answer for that. If I was on the subway and I was strangled for 15 minutes, I would look, where's the MTA in this situation? They were stopped, on the, they were stopped at a subway stop. Nobody came to help him. That's, that, that cannot happen in the world we live in. We talk about fear. We have to have people in place. The MTA has to be responsible so that we're not afraid. We know that if something does happen, we don't have to take matters into our own hands because the MTA is there with their security, with their police to make sure we're safe. best answer to that is because someone has either mental illness or houselessness or has a history of arrest does not make them dispensable. It does not mean that their life has no value. The difference, I think Mike Tyson was the one who said the most disrespectful thing you can do to somebody is put your hands on them. And the difference here is if you lie to somebody, they can, they can work on their reputation. If you steal money from them, they can earn it back. But if you kill them, there's no recovering from that. We have to believe that we can rehabilitate people, that we can help them, that they, can have, that they should have an opportunity to recover from whatever's going on. The, the, the point of us having funds delegated and, and people getting their needs met is so that we can give people a chance to recover and reclaim the life that they should have had. In this case, Jordan's been robbed of that. And, it, and it's important to note. Just, it, it's Im Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Yeah, we, we, we disagree with that. Yes, we disagree with the manslaughter charge. We think it should be murder because he knew it would happen. He knew he would die. But just getting back to your question, I want to remind everybody of this. Daniel Penny did not know Jordan Neely before this incident. That means Daniel Penny did not know how many times he was arrested or if he had ever been arrested at all. So if he, in that statement, put that in there, does that mean he judged him because what he looked like, because he thought he was homeless, because he thought he might have a mental issue? Because there's no way for him to know what Jordan Neely's record was. So that's a non-factor. So for anyone to bring that up and say it impacted the situation, it's it, it, you can't do it. He had no choice. He was going to be charged. He didn't do us. He didn't do anybody a favor. When, when they opened that door, the day they questioned him when he murdered Jordan Neely, they opened that door and said, you can go home. What did he do? He went home. He didn't do anybody a favor by coming back in. They told him, you have to. We're going to charge you. And that's why he went back. So in no aspect is Daniel Penny a hero. In no aspect did Daniel Penny do anything that he should not have been required to do a long time ago. Yeah, I, just want, sir, I, just want add, right I just want to add to that. I spoke to the DA and I specifically questioned him and he answered this. He, he admitted to me that in his 25 years, he could not think of one scenario where there was a victim and a killer, a confession and a video, and the person was merely questioned and sent home. If he couldn't think of one in 25 years, why did they make this one the test for that? Why did they make this one the example for that? He should have been arrested on the spot. Sir, sir, you have a question?
No, no. What we're going to allow the family to do is grieve. We're not in the business of uh, putting people who are devastated on the spot. They are here today because they want it to be so that everybody knows that they're thankful. But they're still grieving. There will be a time when they're ready to speak, but until they're ready, we're not going to have it. Well, I'll tell you this. I was in court this morning in Brooklyn and I took the train back here to the office. I saw more police presence than I've ever seen. The fact that they're doing it now means that they could have done it then. So it's not on, it should not be on the civilians to have to figure out how to protect themselves. It's on, the duty rests with the Transit Authority and the MTA because it's their property, their premises, they're in control. They're supposed to provide this service to the citizens of New York. Absolutely. Absolutely. So here's here's what we want to do. We want to extend the same courtesy to Daniel Penny that he should have extended to Jordan Neely. Here's what that means and what it looks like. We're not going to judge him off of anything he's done in the past. We don't know how he came into that situation, but what we can do is respond to his actions and his words. We do know. No matter what he was going through, he decided not to let go. We also know that he put out a statement making excuses for it. In his statement, he didn't say, I've been going through a lot. I haven't received the help I need, and maybe that factored in. I'm sorry. In his statement, he said, I'm a, dedicated, I'm a decorated Marine. Jordan Neely has a criminal past. The end. That's right. That's what we're going to judge him off of. Not who he was, because we don't know that. But what, by what he did and what he said after. His actions speak louder than his words. Yeah, you're right here. Yeah, so you talked about um, how the mental health system might have failed Mr. Neely. How about the shelter system? Um, or what would be your message on which direction the affordable housing is? Well, first of all, we're going to have to address the affordable housing issue. Again, we have clients. We have um, people that we've talked to people who are calling all different walks of life. And they have loved ones and they have people that they care about who are in all of these situations. The bottom line is attention and compassion and funding. That's what's needed. We can't give up on anyone. And we can't give up on those who need us most when they need us most. And that's what happened here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.